Hello and welcome to this new episode of Not So Fast. In this video, what we are going to talk about is Frenlieu's equation and whether it's a wave equation or not. Now, this video is in part a response to a recent video made by the Science Asylum, which um, is a very interesting one where it was suggested that the Schrodinger equation was not a wave equation. And essentially that the reason why it was called psi, for example, was called a wave function was simply uh, a lost in translation or some historical um, mishappening, I should say. Um, and here I just want to show why um, I, I disagree with some of the claims being made there. But I do encourage you to watch the video. There are very nice insights on um, basically the wave equation and where it originates from. So first, let's have a look at what is a wave, at least as far as this particular video is concerned. So first, phenomenologically, a wave, I'm going to state, is the uh, something for which you can study the motion in space of a persistent local perturbation of the state of a system. And this goes for propagating waves and for standing waves as well. Now, mathematically, that's quite different and slightly more technical. A wave is going to be uh, a requirement where the perturbation we are talking about has to have some regular regularity condition, which is here so-called L2 uh, of R, which is square integrable. So it avoids that things are basically diverging to infinity and things like that. And it must have the form F of X minus VT, where F is an actual function of a single variable and then the spatial and time uh, variables are kind of compounded together into this x minus vt variable. Now there is a second way you can characterize a wave um, and or at least the propagation of it in a sense and that is the density of a conserved quantity that you're going to call rho here is associated to the perturbation in which case you would have that the current is equal to V times rho, where V here is the same as in this expression here. And in both cases, it represents the propagation velocity. Now, um, what is unfortunate as far as terminology goes in um, Anglo-Saxon textbooks is that most texts are going to talk about the wave equation, which is this particular equation here. It's a second order uh, der time derivative equation and second order space derivative equation with the velocity of propagation here. Now, this was the actual case being made in the Sciences Island video that essentially Frenger's equation is not such a wave equation and therefore is not a wave equation, psi is not a wave function, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to go back to that. Uh, I just want to say uh, again that there is a very good explanation about where does the linear uh, uh, wave equation comes from and kind of what do the terms mean in there, which is really physically very interesting and uh, obviously insightful. Now, the problem that I have is that the, by calling that the wave equation, we make a big uh, uh, you know, mistake because this is just one of many, and in particular, d'Alembert's wave equation, or in fact, l the linear wave equation. There are plenty of other wave equations uh, in physics. Here I just mentioned three of them, Berger's equation, Fischer equation, and the kotovec devries uh, equation. I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry about this. Um, you will notice that all of these have a first-order time derivative. They don't need a second-order time derivative to be actual wave equations. Um, on top of this, they are all classical equations. They all exist within the field of classical physics, uh, mostly nonlinear optics, um, continuum mechanics, and fluid dynamics. Okay, so let's go back then to Schrodinger's equation, what it is. So here this is the expression of Schrodinger's equation in 1D, so one dimension. H bar is the so-called reduced uh, Planck constant, it's just H over 2 pi. 
the m here is the mass of the particle you're looking at and the u here is the potential energy uh, of, of the particle really. Now the uh, this quantity psi is the probability amplitude, the so-called probability amplitude, and the i here is the imaginary number, which is such that i squared is equal to minus 1. Now, the argument that was put forward uh, by uh, Science Asylum, and which, was also, which is also obviously a very, very useful tool in theoretical physics, is that if we uh, perform the following change of variable, so we set tau to be equal to it, so some kind of imaginary time, and then we set the potential energy u of x to zero, so meaning that there is no external force field, if you will, then we are going to obtain this equation. Uh, so d psi over d tau is equal to h bar over 2m, and then times the second order derivative uh, in space of psi. Now, if you look at this equation from far away, you're going to say, oh, hold on a second, this looks like the heat equation, uh, where here T, the uppercase T, stands for the temperature, and K for some um, diffusion, heat diffusion coefficient. Okay, but there are quite uh, many differences between them, which are uh, quite substantial. So the first one, which I'm not going to write even, is obviously the one that there is an I here. There is an actual imaginary number in front of the time derivative. So that's a huge deal. It's not the same as having nothing at all here. And I think that should be uh, you know, quite obvious that this is going to make, that this should make a difference at least. Uh, the second problem is that Psi, therefore, is a complex number. Um, so it has a real part and an imaginary part. On the other hand, in the traditional understanding of the heat equation, T is a real and positive scalar field, and that's it. Um, it can represent actually temperature, but in general for diffusion equations, it can represent many other things, like population uh, of some chemicals, uh, it can also represent things having to do with pricing, and sometimes probability as well. Now, because it's a complex number, it turns out that therefore Psi has incredibly many more uh, valid or uh, allowed initial states than does the heat equation, okay? And the, in particular, the temperature variable of the heat equation. And finally, uh, as we are going to see in a minute, um, this uh, Schrodinger equation admits uh, square integrable propagating complex solutions, while actually the heat equation does not admit uh, square integrable propagating real and positive solutions. Okay, um, and so let's illustrate this uh, with the following example. Here I'm going to plot the temperature, so that's a simulation in 1D, uh, where here you've got the, the, uh, an initial state, an initial distribution of the temperature, um, so that's the magnitude of it, of the temperature, that's space. Um, and I'm going to use the same uh, kind of initial perturbation here. I'm going to use the same, so that's what I'm doing here, except that I'm adding to it a phase factor, okay, that depends on space. And this phase factor is going to change everything. And in particular, it's going to give, if you will, an impulse to the uh, actual perturbation that we are going to look at. Now what I'm going to plot, just to that we are clear on colors, is that on the left hand side, uh, in blue, I'm going to plot the real part of Psi, and in, in orange, yellow, I'm going to plot the uh, imaginary part of Psi. And of course here in blue, I'm plotting the temperature. So let's see what happens. So you see that what happens is that uh, both of them actually spread, which is indeed a characteristic of the diffusive aspect of the heat equation. So that's perfectly correct. And uh, the, the video in the Science of Zynum, um, uh video was explaining that very well. But this phase factor that we could add actually gave an impulse. And basically, this uh, packet actually spreads and propagates at the same time, like a wave would do, okay? Uh, we can actually look at the so-called probability density, which is rho is equal to modulus squared of psi, and observe that indeed 
uh, it goes down exactly like the temperature does okay you see exactly like it does except that it's propagating uh, toward the left at a finite speed which is actually constant in that case now i'm not showing uh, the equations they are really very cumbersome but you can actually re-express them to have the form f of x minus vt i had mentioned earlier for for this particular uh, part on the left okay so let's have a look at the density analysis now first let's look at the right hand side so the heat equation which is a diffusion equation so it can be recast in the following manner because t is already a scalar quantity and so in that case you've got dt of a i mean sorry it's a derivative of the rate of change of the temperature is equal to minus the spatial rate of change of the current that's a typical equation called the continuity equation which is characteristic of conserved quantities now necessarily if this has to be true and this has to be true it follows that j has to be equal to minus k times the spatial derivative of the temperature and so that's a characteristic feature of diffusion which is that the current is proportional to the uh, gradient of the quantity you're looking at now let's look at schrodinger's equation in this particular case because it's a complex quantity we're looking at it turns out that there is a dual twin equation which has to do with the equation followed by the complex conjugate of psi uh, and which is simply minus i h bar and then d psi star of a dt is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m and there's a second order derivative in space of psi star now i can put these two equations together in the following fashion first multiply each of them by the corresponding uh, probability amplitude conjugate so here psi, psi star and here psi and then subtract the two in the following fashion and then you can recast the whole thing at, 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 as, as a continuity equation d rho over dt is equal to minus dj over dx and in that case you would find that rho is equal to the modulus squared of psi which is the probability density and then j is actually the so-called probability current which in my opinion is not talked about enough it's a very very insightful quantity to look at so it's h bar over m times the imaginary part of the product of psi with the gradient of its complex conjugate so it's something quite intricate really to evaluate and at face value and at first sight is quite different from this one okay um, so to illustrate this let's look at a simple example which is that of the paradigma paradigmatic uh, plane wave which is essentially the infinite time limit of the simulation I've shown you earlier of this wave propagating toward the left so we've got psi is equal to a time which is a prefactor uh, exponential i over p uh, i sorry times p over h bar x minus omega t omega is a normal kind of frequency uh, time frequency and p here represents the momentum of the particle now if we calcul calculate rho we'll find this is going to be uh, to equal to the modulus squared of a so that's a uniform probability density everywhere in space but if we look at the current we are going to find that this is j is equal to p over m and then times rho itself but if you've done a little bit of mechanics uh, yourself you know that the momentum divided by m is nothing but the velocity of the particle therefore we find that the current is equal to the velocity times rho which is characteristic um, actually of wave uh, behavior of propagating waves okay so therefore we have here further evidence that it does behave uh, or creates at least wave-like behavior i want to finish with a final uh, thought here which is by adding some potential now it turns out that the potential wave behavior uh, in quantum mechanics is more visible when we try to put particles in a confined uh, region of space. 
and what better confinement there is than an actual box uh, from which particles cannot exist, uh, cannot exist, cannot exit. So here I'm just plotting the probability density directly of a particle in two dimension and uh, you, the walls here are represented by these dark lines and the the more the yellow and white represent really very low probabilities and the more you go that way to the center the more likely is a proba the probability for the particle to be there okay so what i'm going to do is simply run the simulation and we'll see what we can conclude from it so very quickly what you see is that the particle appears to be bouncing on and off the walls but as it does so it also spreads as we've seen earlier but what happens is quite interesting. The spread of the particle actually goes onto the walls, but because it cannot go any further, it kind of bounces back and then interferes with the particle, the, you know, with the, the um, probability amplitude of the particle itself, which ends up creating, creating uh, all this interference pattern we see on the, during the animation. Okay, so I think it's quite obvious here that there is a wave-like behavior if you put a particle uh, in a 2D box. Um, and of course, this is something we had seen before as well. So keep in mind that waves doesn't necessarily mean that there should be oscillation, interference, or anything like that. It has to do with something which is able to somehow self-sustain itself with the persistence of a perturbation in space and time. OK. so. Uh, the bottom line here is that this is obviously not a, a clash that I'm trying to uh, to have with the Science Asylum video. Um, the only thing I would like to say is that if one decides that the V wave equation, which is the linear d'Alembert equation uh, for the wave equation, is defining anything that can be a wave, then of course um, the, science, uh, the Science Asylum video is perfectly correct. My contention with this is that I think that um, abiding by this very restricted definition actually um, um, is quite problematic because we miss out on plenty of other wave-like behavior in many other branches of physics, including that uh, provided by solutions to Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so on this note, uh, thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.